Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you decided to join us. We're doing a series, as you may know, on the Sabbath School lesson that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2012. It's a series entitled Growing in Christ, and this particular lesson is entitled Victory Over Evil Forces. It's a lesson for November 10 of 2012. It's lesson number six. But before we uh, get started, we'd like you to take your Bible and get ready, and let's have prayer together before we begin. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have freely to study your scriptures, to study your word, to learn about you. Help us to understand what it means to conquer evil forces. We know how vigorous the devil has been since the beginning of sin many, many, many years ago. And now in our day, he's looking to uh, secure this world. Re Revelation 13 says al he will almost convince the entire world to follow his way. Help us not to be deceived. Help us to be prepared, prepared for that when that time comes. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson will focus on how Christians are to claim victory in Christ. You may be aware that Jesus sent out his disciples three different times when they were working in Galilee and later once when they were working in Perea. In fact, the episode, the time when they were in Perea, he sent out 72 men, or men and women, probably men, uh, and gave them power over demonic forces, power to heal the sick, even to raise the dead and to cleanse lepers. Why don't you think we have more information about what happened on those occasions? We have almost no information about that at all. Did they raise people from the dead? That would be a pretty amazing thing. You would have thought they would have reported on it. Uh, were they able to write those days? Um, they had paper and pen? Well, different than we, but they did write the Gospels later, about 30 years later. Could they have written them down and they were destroyed? Well, that's always a possibility, yeah. Um, we don't know. So, um, but you would have thought that they would have told us more if they were busy doing this kind of stuff. We know that later, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead, Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. Yeah, so, so why do we know about those, but we don't know yeah. about the others? Well, should we be performing more miracles today? Well, sorry to go back to the earlier one mm, just yeah. a moment ago, but we kind of do know because Jesus said that he gave them the power to do that. Mm -hmm. So we can, I think, correctly assume that they did. And John, at the end of his gospel, which wasn't written until 60 years later, said, if I wrote down, if we tried to write down everything that Jesus did, you know, all the books in the world couldn't contain it or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, should we be performing more miracles today? You can watch TV on Sunday morning and there's people claiming to do miracles all the time. I've seen, I have personally have seen some miracles mm -hmm. um, in the local hospital here, uh, Loma Linda University Medical Center. Groups of uh, young, young faithful go in and they, they pray for the patients, they sing songs for them and, and uh, I've actually seen, you know, many like uh, people that have had spine damage and brain damage and suddenly the next week they're back fine where the doctor said it was ir you know irreparable so mm -hmm. wow well what, what are miracles supposed to do for you if you watch them that's I mean, a very good question because what happens if you watch the tv programs the way it works is like this the the, the evangelist will perform something and pre he will call it a miracle and then he will say okay because I performed this miracle that's proof I have connection with God so now whatever I say to you must be from God that's the way it's usually it's usually done it's supposed to be a proof of the fact that I'm working directly with God that can be manipulated though yes oh, if yeah. they have a little ear earpiece and someone goes out and they listen to the audience, who's who, and then they call it back to the 
evangelist or so-called evangelist, but I'm sure that there are real miracles out mm -hmm. there as well. Some I'm of them, they launch forth in some verbal mumbo jumbo, as I understand speaking in tongues from the Bible, people understood what was going on. In, yeah, in, in These Acts 2 they were. you usually don't understand, nobody does. Yeah. We have one miracle worker priest, uh, preacher on TV who goes to the um, exercise tennis club I do, and he plays tennis there. And I'm always curious if this man does miracles like his TV program shows, how come he walks by the spinal patients at the club because it has a spinal injury center? And uh, does he lose tennis games? And I mean, he's <laughs> just a regular man walking through the club, but if you see him on TV, he's bigger than life, and his enthusiasm, uh, when he's walking where I know him, see him personally, he's just so nondescript quiet. But when mm -hmm. you see him on TV, he's boisterous and mm -hmm. whatever. But I have never seen him uh, stop and um, heal one of the spinal patients that uh, he walks yeah. by. Well, what, do, what does victory in Christ actually mean? That's what we're talking about today. What is victory? Well, what's the difference between claiming, or is there a relationship between claiming victory and actually being victorious? Yes. Okay. He got, he got the victory over the devil. The devil's still alive and well here, but if we're going to make it through to the end, we need to develop the capacity to get close to him. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't is, think is, you can do it on your own. Is what we're talking about here victory over sin? Is that what we're talking about? Or victory over demons, over demonic forces? All of the above. All of the above. And we, I, we claim that victory through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's his victory and we're just kind of, through faith, we, we partake in that. To so, me, it seems like victory should be a final finality somehow. Is it? Or is it just a skirmish that you have victory well over? Well, you, could, and you can win a battle. And not, it could happen again. You could win a battle without winning the war. That's right. Now, there's, there's a victory that's supposed to be, that's prophesied for all of us mm -hmm. at the end of time. Uh, that's going to be, is that a different victory than what you're talking about, or is it? That's victorious when you're going up to mm -hmm. them. Well, didn't Jesus say one time, Satan has nothing in me? Mm -hmm. And I always thought I would love to say Satan has nothing in me, and that yeah. means that Satan has no handle he can grab in you to make you want to sin. Yeah. And so would that be considered victorious, that Satan would be at you still, but Satan has nothing in me. He has nothing to convince me to follow him. Would that be victory in Christ? Well, I mean, isn't that what Jesus demonstrated when he went through his temptations? Definitely. But is, is Christianity intended to be a solution to the problems of everyday life? Or are we still going to have problems? We have problems. We live in a sinful world, don't we? Well, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should be constantly aware of the fact that our minds are the battleground in the great controversy. We are not just dealing with forces and powers here on this earth. We're dealing with universe-wide issues. We, should, we, we shouldn't make any mistake. God has already won the great controversy. That was accomplished by Christ 2,000 years ago. Does that mean that Satan is a defeated foe? As you take on the challenge of temptations and problems in your own life, does it seem like Satan is a defeated foe? You know, if the battleground for sin is in our mind, shouldn't we be doing whatever we can to strengthen our mind, to preserve our mind, mm -hmm. to make our mind clear and have wa uh, wisdom? Um, that should be our top priority. If this is the battleground that Satan uses our mind, and Paul suggests in, in, in Romans 12 that we need to keep our, our health the best we possibly can so that our minds will be clear to think about God. Yes. You, men 
you mentioned before about how many of us say get thee behind me Satan I tell my son if you're having a bad thought the way to stop it is by saying something as you're thinking something that's why it's good to know scripture mm -hmm. you know you speak against it and the thought stops and you have to keep doing that sometimes you have to keep doing that and doing that and doing that regarding I've experienced miracles but sometimes you don't want to say them sometimes because other people have not and I'm surprised that more people have not. Hmm. But it doesn't change anything. And you, you ask, how come, God, you saved me from this, then how come this, this, this happened? It doesn't make I'll, 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 I'll illustrate that. I, I'm a physician. I spent many years working in Africa. And the one time, I, one time I think a miracle happened to me. I mean, there were some other times, but one time I thought was very clear. I was called to the hospital in the middle of the night. We, the hospital had no power, so the only lights we had were hurricane lanterns, these little old-fashioned wick things that you turn up, you know, flickering things. So I'm called down there, and here's this child that was probably two to three years old, severe vomiting and diarrhea, and completely dehydrated. I mean, so dehydrated that when I listened to her chest, the heart beating in, in the pericardium was going, I mean, it was like sandpaper rubbing in there. It was incredible. I said, this kid is not going to live another few minutes at this rate. And the only possible way to solve that child's problem was to get some fluids in there really fast. And I realized that a child of that age, you'd probably want to try a scalp vein. But here I am in the middle of the night in a hospital with no lights. I have these little flickering lamps, and you're trying to hit a, a vein in the scalp a on a, in, a, in a, a small vein in the scalp, a child who's black, black skin, what are the chances? Yeah. And I said, God, if this, if this child doesn't get help in a few minutes, it's going to be dead. And so I just took my, my little IV solution. I said, here we go. And it went straight into vein the first time. And I said, you know, that, 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 that's not just good luck. You know, and the next day the child was sitting up and looking normal was amazing, wow. just amazing. Mm. What you had an child? angel guiding your... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, what? What has that child done in subsequent years? Has he done great things or do you We know? have no idea. I Don't have no know. idea, no way of tracing it. Well, in the great controversy, if we go back to the beginning on this earth, not all the way back to heaven, but although we could trace it back into heaven, Revelation 12, we notice in Genesis 2.17, and we really need to start with verse 15, these interesting words. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Now, do you think that Adam and Eve were well aware of that warning? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and they, were, they were well aware of that. Okay, so you know that Eve wandered close to the tree. This, that tree was located close to the tree of life. They had to pass it probably every day when they went to eat of the tree of life. And there was a snake. She had wandered away from Adam. The snake starts talking to her. You know the story. Verse 4, it says, a snake and, and she asked about, you know, can you eat of every tree and so forth. And a little bit of a conversation. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. So he was right, just blatantly, right up front, claiming that God is a liar. How would you respond to someone who says God is a liar? Earlier you said this is a battle for the minds. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep our mind pure and obviously Satan was there in heaven so he saw God we, I, I don't know about the rest of you, I haven't physically seen the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, um, but whenever Satan comes around, we have to remember that it's God wants us to follow him from our mind. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we, we naturally push Satan away. Yeah. Well, there's a very interesting statement found in Ephesians 1, starting with verse 18. Look at those, those words. Paul, and of course he's writing to the Christians in northern um, Asia Minor. 
I ask that your minds be opened to see his light, so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working on us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. What, what, what power was it that raised Christ from the death? From death? The divine power. His own divine power. His own divine power. Look at John 10, 18. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up, and I have the right, and the word there is authority, to take it back. This is what my Father has commanded me to do. And an interesting verse where they, they uh, used against Christ very much is found also in John. Look at John 2, verse 19. Jesus answered, Tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it again. Suggesting that he's going to do what? Raise it. He's going to rise to life himself, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, Desire of Ages, 785 and 5, Volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, page 1113, paragraph 6, say very clearly that Christ rose from the dead on his own power, proving that he is not a creature just like Satan, but that he is a creator, that he is in fact fully God. Does the fact, then, that Christ has conquered all make it easier for you to deal with temptation? I don't know if at the time I conscious of, okay, I don't do this exactly, but I think so. I believe so. The more you believe in God, it, you, you get a sort of peace that you can't really understand, mm -hmm. that you're not as shaken about things. You f I, there are things that I would not do that I know I cannot do and would not do. And it's because I believe, I, I believe in God fully and completely, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't have that belief in people. What I see and what I believe, a lot of times are not congruent, but I know in everything God is there. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly in the great controversy, there are two sides. You can't have a controversy without at least two sides. Satan is constantly tempting us and then throwing our mistakes back at us and at God, claiming that we do not deserve heaven. Um, look at Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest, Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and there beside Joshua stood Satan. What's he doing? Ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord, this is God's messenger, uh, we believe it was Jesus Christ, said to Satan, may the Lord, and there it is, Yahweh, the, the personal name for God, condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a snake's stick snatched from the fire. What's and, interesting and, and there, so this is a high priest, mm -hmm. and he has Satan standing right next to him. You would think that the high priest would have this electric type fence around him for a couple miles that Satan couldn't get in. But here we have Satan right next to a high priest. Yeah. So if Satan is going to be taunting the high priest, what is he going to be doing to us? I mean, I mean he's going to be right there with us also. Well, another part of that story is, is uh, of how Satan behaves like that is found in, in Revelation 12. I mean, just to look at that very briefly, Revelation 12, verses 10 to 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. So who, who is it that brings accusations against us day and night? Satan. Yeah. If, Very. I, if I might say, say so, verse 11, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Mm -hmm. So they have, we have, we all have something to say mm -hmm. about that struggle also. Well, what's interesting is the angels in heaven do not know well, maybe they know the struggle that Satan was in heaven, but do they know the struggles like we face here on earth? The angels in heaven. Not the same. Not the same. 
it's interesting and it's important for us to recognize that if you turn to Romans 8, now if you remember the first eight chapters of Romans are Paul's marvelous presentation of the gospel. And he draws, draws a conclusion at the end of Romans 8, and we don't have time here to read the whole passage, but if you start from verse 26 to verse 39, he will say absolutely every member of the Holy Spirit mentioned by name, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray as we should, the Son has come and lived and died on our behalf, the Father who gave his Son would not have done that if he didn't love us. All three members of the Godhead are fully on our side. Amen. So now we know who's against us, and now we know who's for us, right? Yes. So, um, look, look at Romans 8. Let's just pick a couple of verses. Look at verses 29 and 30 there in Romans 8. Those whom God has already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son. So what is his intention for those of us who want to be like God? He's going to make us like his son, isn't he? Mm -hmm. yes. So that the son would be the eldest brother in a large family. And so those whom God set apart, he called. And those he called, he put right with himself. That's justified. And he shared his glory with them. Now, it says there, those whom God had already chosen. How do we know that we have already been chosen? Yeah. Well, that's the question. This These verses were have been used very often to try to suggest that there's a thing called predestination. That we, you know, we don't really have any freedom. God has already chosen, I'm going to save you and you and you and you and not you and you. Um, is that what these verses actually say? Well, no, it isn't. Because the word here, those you've already chosen, the, the word in Greek is prohorizo. Horizo, does that sound like any English words that you recognize? Horizon. 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 Sounds like horizon, doesn't it? So when we say pro horizon, what we're saying is there when you're born, they, you're already there are already certain certain boundaries that are set for you. I will never be a woman. I never be black like Yoli here. I will never be Asian. See? I, and the fact that I grew up in America means that I'm my, my mother tongue will always be English. Now I may learn I I've practiced medicine in five different languages in my life, but those are not my mother tongue. So there are certain boundaries, and the longer you live, the more, every time you make a choice, you're choosing against something else. So you're, there are boundaries. That's the prohorizo. But it's not like God said, okay, you have to do this and this and this and this and this, and you don't have any choice. No, it's not that at all. I so like, I like verse 26. Mm -hmm. <coughs> In the same way, the Spirit helps us in, in our weakness. Mm -hmm. we, do not, we do not know what we are to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Mm -hmm. There are times you are so, you can't even pray. Mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to even really s sit and pray, and it's good to know mm -hmm. that the, the Holy Spirit is there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, those are the verses. That's the verse that says the Holy Spirit is working for us, Jesus is working for us. The Father is working for us. They're all on our side. And, and the passage that we all know is verse 31. If God is for us, who can be yes. against us? Mm -hmm. I stand by that. Exactly. And we, he's talking about all three members of the Godhead. Yes. Yeah. Well, Ellen White has a passage that I think we all would really benefit from reading and thinking about and reading again. Uh, a couple of passages. This one is found in Desire of Ages page 668, paragraph 3. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Now, there's a very subtle but a very important point being made here that might not be immediately obvious. What is our role? If we consent. So, in other words, we say, God, come into my life. Take, be a part of my life. I want to know you more. I want to study about you. I want to learn about you, so forth. And what does he do? He makes the changes. So it's not me who's 
becoming more like Christ. Christ can make me more like him if I allow him to do that, if I give him the opportunity. All we have to do is consent. Now, this is not a case of once saved, always saved. We just, yeah, I want to be a Christian. Okay, now I'll go on with my way, I'll, on with my business. I'll do whatever I like for the rest of my life, and I already sealed the deal for my trip to heaven. No, it's talking about giving Christ the opportunity to work in my life every day, every day, every day. Well, um, from a female point of view, so we do not have to rearrange the furniture and, and dust and clean up before we say, Christ, you can come in. We just say, Christ, come in, and then he helps us clean the furniture and dust and get everything in order? Not just helps us, he does it. He does it. But we have to give him the time. Yeah. So go ahead and open the door, even though you have a messy house inside. Yes. <laughs> on, the other, on the other hand, if we consent to allow the devil to come into our right. lives, he will certainly do that. Yes. Well, you make it sound really easy. I come with so. It is. It is easy. Yeah. Oh, you you that got you're, easy, you turned into a saint already. But there's a struggle <laughs> yeah. in a doing struggle. it. But the decision is easy. The decision is easy, but um, it has to be made repeatedly. It's daily. It keeps happening daily. Um, okay. <laughs> the will refined. Let me read the rest of it. The will that would be my will, my choice, refined and sanctified. If I'm doing this every day, pretty soon it gets easier. We find its will find its highest delight in doing His service, in serving God. That's the thing that makes me the most happy. When we know God is, as it is our privilege to know Him, notice what we're trying to accomplish here. As we know God, as, if we know God as it is our privilege to know Him, our challenge is to get to know God and to know Him very well. Our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Now, isn't that, isn't that what we all want? There's this uh, gentleman in my water aerobics class who um, is in there because of his uh, he needs strength in his knees. And his daughter showed him the film, Forks Over Knives, mm -hmm. is it? And uh, he was a great meat eater mm -hmm. and um, having problems. And he started to eat vegetables just because I haven't seen that film yet, but he, he said it was it just knocked him up, knocked him down. And now he says, oh, today uh, his wife works, and he says, today I get to go home and roast vegetables. Mm -hmm. And he says, they taste so good to me. And he said, before, I never even would have thought I would be eaten this way. So his delight is now doing what is good for him. And that's how God changes your heart. I mean, it's not like you begrudgingly say, oh, now I've got to eat my veggies. I mean, he, he likes to go home and his favorite thing is to olive oil and, and uh, salt and pepper and roast them. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he just savors the thought of going home and, he, and, and doing that. And so mm -hmm. now his delight is doing what's good for him. So isn't that wonderful that, that God can make us like to do what's yeah. good for us? So is, are you talking about an analogy here, or are we talking about a <laughs> culinary <laughs> well, conversion? What, I, what <laughs> I'm saying is, for, for some of us, we understand that very well. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying I is that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not that the point. God can no. change what no, you no, used no. to you hate, you can yeah, actually exactly. like. And some people yeah. don't think, some people, you could even like vegetables. some people no. will like to smoke and say, how can I ever give up smoking? Yeah. I enjoy it. Well, and and God will make it like, I hate smoking, and I don't know how I ever enjoyed it. Well, let me tell you my story, since you told one like that. My next to the last patient this afternoon, just before I came to this program, was a patient with great big ulcers all over both legs. We had to clean them and dress them and all this kind of stuff. And he had ulcers like that one time ago. He was, he's somewhat overweight, and he was a heavy smoker. And he had all these ulcers on him. And some things happened to him, and he was institutionalized for a while, and he could not smoke. And all of his ulcers went away. And he thought, man, this is great. Went, away, went home, started smoking again, and guess what happened? Right. All the ulcers came back again. 
And he, he's complaining in my oh, these feet hurt so bad and so forth. And guess what? If you stop smoking again, it will go away. You know, maybe I should stop smoking. You know, <laughs> the. <laughs> well, another quotation of Desire of Ages, 671, paragraph 2. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Oh, you mean we can't wow. claim? Well, my mother gave me that. It must be my, my, my dad's fault or my mom's fault or something. No, we can't claim that. Well, we all need to consider the meaning of these passages. None of us has an excuse for not making any progress in the Christian life. The best help in the universe is available to us if we recognize it and claim it and allow God to work in us. James, Jesus' older stepbrother, said in James 4, 7, So then, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Okay, Gary, there's your, there's your key verse. It's my key verse. Mm -hmm. But does it God. work? Does it work? Does it yes, work? It Are you Have doubting you the word of God? Does it work? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, it does. Can somebody tell me? Will it work? Well, what is the any best, testimonies around here? What is the best way to resist <laughs> the devil? One of the very important lessons we need to learn about dealing with temptation is to exercise that power at the very beginning of the temptation. Let me give you some examples. The morbidly obese overeater should not first thinking about re think about resisting temptation with the donut already in his hand. <laughs> as a little late. The alcoholic should not first be thinking about giving up alcohol while sitting at the bar. We need to learn to resist the very first inclinations of temptation. Remember we're talking about sin becoming hateful to us. We need to take a very firm stand, which is the meaning of resist in James 4, 7. 4, 7. We need to take a very firm stand against the devil. Well, what does the devil, how does the devil do his thing? Have you? Uh, Deceptively. Deceptively. Look at 1 Peter 5, starting with verse 6. Humble yourselves then under God's mighty hand so that he will lift you up in his own good time. Leave all your worries with him because he cares for you. I recently uh, read, in fact, I got it from my birthday not long ago, a little book that uh, someone gave me. And I opened it up. It's, it, it's, this is heavenly humor. And it says, if you feel like stresses is just absolutely getting you down, like here, leave all your worries before him. If you feel like stresses are just getting you down, remember this. Moses was once a basket case. He was also a murderer. That was 40 years later. Yeah. Well, it goes on here. Be alert. Be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him because you know that your fellow believers in all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ, will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and a sure foundation. So? Sounds easy. You know, I th There's the directions right there. All you right have there. to do is go through 80, 90, 100 years or so of, of exactly. that easy <laughs> life, and then it gets even easier. You know, I think the devil uses with us the same thing he used with Eve, mm -hmm. that you will... He's a lot better at God it. God is withholding something good from you, or if you do this, you will be happier. And all of the teen kids are getting lured with... Uh, now um, in their sexuality. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you don't try this and this and this, you're yeah. missing out. And yeah. it's the same thing that was told to Eve. Yeah. How does it make you feel to know that the Deborah, devil is wandering around like a roaring lion? Mm -hmm. uh, having spent a lot of time in Africa, I have slept out in a tent and had lions very close by, you know, mm. <laughs> and you hear that kind of a noise and you... <laughs> You know you have friends. <laughs> but, God, but Peter assured us that we should leave our worries to God, who will help us to resist the devil. He will help us with firmness, strength, and a sure foundation if we give him the opportunity 
By contrast, we must never give the devil an opportunity, and that's, of course, Ephesians 4, 27. The, sorry. the world we live in today is harder than you know, the, what they experience, because now even in, in your own house, you cannot protect your children because mm -hmm. it's the Internet. Mm -hmm. There's so many things they can, you can see and get to. The uh, ads on television, the people drinking always have big smile. It's always a, uh, mm -hmm. when the reality is cirrhosis of the liver, it's, mm -hmm. you know, drunk driving yeah, accident. It was interesting last week um, on ABC News, they said a big study has just come out of Spain. Mm -hmm. And you, I'm, I, you all must have heard sometime in the last couple of years this idea that if you drink wine, mm -hmm. it'll help your heart, you'll live longer. Well, they did this big study in Spain and came out with a road. Guess what? The red wine works best if you take no the alcohol, alcohol out. Yes, I yes. saw that. No alcohol, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Peter wrote his two letters late in his ministry when he was probably already suffering persecution. As we know, he was eventually imprisoned in that hollowed out rock prison known as the Mamertine Prison in Rome and eventually crucified upside down. Through all of that, he encouraged those who are suffering. Well, you know, one thing in our culture, not only is the internet and the TV commercials coming in, then our culture is putting God out. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, our younger people don't have the influence of God, yet they have the stuff coming in. And that, that to me is like a roaring lion. Satan knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. We mentioned earlier that Jesus had sent his disciples out you can read about that, Matthew 10, 1 to 8, Mark 6, uh, verse 7 and 12 and 13, and Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, and Luke 10, verses 1 to 20. And that's the time when he sent his 72 men out uh, all over the Perea. Uh, look, at the, look at the last couple of verses there. Um, verse 18, let's start with verse 18. Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus answered them, I saw, and, and the disciples said, these, these 72 had come back now and said, Lord, guess what? Even the devils are subject to us. And Jesus answered them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Listen, I have given you authority so that you can walk on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. But don't be glad because the evil spirits obey you. Rather be glad because your names are written in heaven. And I'm reminded of Luke 15, where he says there's more rejoicing over what? One. One sinner who repents than over 99 just people, righteous people, who don't need any repentance. And hopefully those 99 are also happy and rejoicing. Yes. And not, like the, uh, mm. not like the big brother in the prodigal son <laughs> story. Well, do you think if we gain victory over the devil, uh, heaven will rejoice? Yeah. Shouldn't we want? heaven to rejoice. Does that mean that um, we ought to all be learning how to do exorcisms? <laughs> so when we overcome uh, a sin or temptation and we're able to do that, could we envision angels cheering up there and saying, yeah. right on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That well, might help. Are there demons that we need to face that need to be cast out? If we are doing what God wants us to do, we must re recognize that Satan will do whatever he can to oppose us. I mean, don't we believe that? What would it look like to have a demon in us? Well, let me give you an example that I, I, I have read about. While he was hidden away in the Wartburg Castle, Martin Luther chose to translate, and, and some of you know the story how he was, he, he, the, the church was going to arrest him and kill him, and one of his friends sort of kidnapped him and took him away and hid him away for about a year. And he lived, and I've had the privilege of visiting the Wartburg Castle. You can go up there, and way up in the remote reaches of that castle was his little place where he stayed, so nobody knew he was there. While he was hidden away in the Wartburg Castle, Martin Luther chose to translate the New Testament from Greek into German. It is reported that on one occasion while he was there, the devil appeared to him in his room and tried to frighten him. Now, think about it. This is the first time a... a relatively modern, those days it would be up-to-date person, was actually trying to translate the Bible into a current uh, European language. 
How do you think the devil felt about that? That was my point. He was not happy at all about it. So what happened? It was reported that on one occasion while he was there, the devil appeared to him in his room and tried to frighten him. Luther took an ink bottle and threw it at him. So that was a pretty... Well, ink bottles are probably not dangerous to demons. Luther apparently recognized the very real presence of the devil. Yeah, it had to be real for him to pick up an ink bottle. Yeah, uh, surely the devil recognized what would be accomplished if Luther succeeded in finishing his work on the German translation of the Bible, and of course he finally did. Are we able to recognize the presence of the devil in our lives? Not Perhaps. always. Hmm? Not always. Not always? I have this interesting thing. Whenever I'm doing something or working with something or maybe going to pass out booklets or something, if something bad happens that I have to make a double effort to, in order to do it, I always think that what, what I was going to do might have great effect. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's proof that um, you know, maybe you're doing what Satan doesn't want you to do. So what's the key to victory over the devil? since we're talking about victory over evil forces? Well, I think one thing for sure is that you have to believe that he actually exists. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people yeah. will believe in Christ, but they don't know too much about the Satan business. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if, if people know that he's there, he's got less power right then starting, yeah. starting out. Well, in his last evening with his disciples, Jesus promised them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he went on to explain a lot of things about what the Holy Spirit would be able to do with them if they were willing to cooperate with him. And it's spread all out through John 14 through 16. Do those promises still apply to us? Yes. How do you know that? Look at John 17, the next chapter, and verse 20, where Jesus is praying about his disciples. And he says, I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. And it goes on to talk about all of us. In fact, let me read the rest of that. I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us just as you are in me and I'm in you. God wants us to have the kind of relationship among believers and between believers and God as he has between himself and his father. I mean, what kind of relationship must that be? I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be completely one in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love me as you love them as you love me and so forth. That's a, that's a pretty incredible promise if you think about it. Well, we know what the ultimate result was. When Jesus was crucified, the disciples uh, were in terror, hiding behind locked doors in the upper room for fear that they would be next. But when they realized that Jesus had risen from the dead, and it began to dawn on them that the one that they had spent all that time with was, in fact, fully God, a tremendous transformation took place in their thinking. They came together, no longer fighting for the first position in an earthly kingdom, but as brothers and sisters claiming victory in Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. When the early rain was poured out on Pentecost in Jerusalem, the results were evident. Even after this, ever after that, the disciples had the capacity to speak any language, the capacity to heal any disease, and even the capacity to raise people from the dead. Peter did it, Acts 9, 36 to 42. So did Paul, Acts 20, 9 to 12. Paul, who was not there on that occasion, but later became the most outstanding apostle of all, demonstrated his power to cast out demons in Philippi, Acts 16, 16 to 18. It is interesting to note that on that occasion, the demon-possessed woman called Paul and Silas, quote, servants of the Most High God, close quote. And Paul apparently didn't like that. Now, the Greek word is elion. It is possible that on that occasion, she was referring to one of the Canaanite gods who was called Elion, the Most High. So I've always wondered about that verse. Maybe that's the explanation. Mm -hmm. So she was actually, this woman was actually calling Paul part of the devil. Mm -hmm. 
possibly. That, that's one, one possibility, mm -hmm. rather than a servant of God. Mm -hmm. And she was calling mm -hmm. the Most High this... Canaanite God. Canaanite God. That's his right. name. Uh -huh. the, the word Elion referred to. Wasn't there an event with Jesus where somebody yes. was calling him the Son of God and mm -hmm. Jesus didn't like that either and he mm -hmm. got her to quiet down by casting a demon out of her? He, 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 several times that happened in Jesus' ministry. So um, what's wrong with that? Well, it's interesting to notice, and we don't have time to discuss this right now, but one time Jesus took a boat, traveled across the Sea of Galilee, ran into two demon-possessed men, cast 2,000 demons out of them apparently, or some huge number like that. Those demons went into the pigs, went down the, ran down the cliff, drowned in, in, in the Sea of Galilee. And what did he tell those people? Those two people, those two men? Go back and tell your friends at home what God has done for you. How long did he spend with Jesus? Part of a day. Maybe an hour or two? Yeah, not long. How much did he know? So he Enough so that when he went back and told his neighbors, the next time Jesus showed up, what happened? The whole place wanted, they wanted to see this Jesus and see what kind of person he was. So you're saying that these other people that Jesus cast demons out of probably went somewhere and did their missionary... No, I'm saying that probably, I think, I think it was a very different situation. Mm -hmm. I think that the other people, if they had <coughs> gone and started proclaiming the gospel, see, Jesus didn't tell these, these two men, go and tell the gospel. He said, go and tell them what the Lord has done for you. These other people, if they had gone, they would have tried to say, well, I, you know, I was healed by the Messiah. You know what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to come here. He's going to, he's going to, make, he's going to free us from the Romans, etc. I think he told them not to, not to talk because he figured they would go and misrepresent him. Mm. Okay. Well, apparently Peter and John became so famous in Jerusalem for their capacity to heal the sick and cleanse lepers that, as we read in Acts 5, <coughs> 12 to 16, People would line the sick along the streets where they thought Peter would pass in hopes that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of the sick people and might make them well. Do you think anybody was actually healed by Peter's shadow? I do. I think because Jesus said often, he said, your faith has healed you. Mm -hmm. And their faith was, you know, I mean, that's a lot of faith to think that someone's shadow the other, would heal them. The other time when the woman touched him and he said, I feel power's gone, power's out, of gone out of me. And he spun around and who was it? And she was kind of a bit reticent to own up, but she did. So they feel something. Mm -hmm. And she only touched his garment. Yeah. yeah because she anyway. believed she had that faith. Well, here we're talking about just a shadow. <laughs> That's a lot of faith. Well, how about something even Not more even than Jesus that? Jesus' shadow. Acts 19, 11, and 12. This is... Uh, I think uh, Paul and Silas, Paul in Ephesus, God was performing unusual miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons he had used were taken to the sick and their diseases were driven out and the evil spirits would go out of them. Not Acts 19 what? 11 and 12. So it, it yeah. seems almost superstitious, but it's mm -hmm. somehow God was working through yeah. In strange Even ways. Even handkerchiefs and aprons. Yeah. Yep. Well, how do you think, I, I always try to put myself in these stories and think what I would do. How do you think the members of the Sanhedrin responded when they saw people lying in the streets hoping Peter would pass by when they had denied Peter's ability to heal the sick? I don't think they were too happy. <laughs> those, they were too happy. <laughs> those Sanhedrin didn't have the same type of faith. Yeah. Mm. Remember that they had, okay. yes. By the way, uh, back in Acts 5, uh, 16, where you were talking about the shadow, mm -hmm. the, in verse 16 it says, and they were all healed, talking about the, the shadow of Peter and yeah. Paul. Well, they were all healed. Yeah. 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 Remember, faith spreads. Yeah. Remember what happened after that experience when Peter and John were, were in prison. They'd healed the man at the gate, beautiful, and then they were in prison. They were called before the Sanhedrin, and then they were told, you know, they had no answer. And Peter's speech was so potent they didn't know what to say, and so they were sent out, 
And finally they came, they were called back. So they look at Acts 4 verse 18. So they called them back in and told them that on no condition were they to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. That was the instruction that Sanhedrin had given them. But Peter and John answered them, you yourselves judge which is right in God's sight. Now remember, they're talking to the church leaders, the government leaders of God's true people, hopefully. Uh, these are the highest religious authorities in the world. Uh, you yourselves judge which is right in God's sight, to obey you or to obey God. For we cannot stop speaking what we ourselves have seen and heard. I mean, I mean what do you, how do you respond to something like that? I think it's fair to think that they'd prefer not to come head to head with Peter. Yeah. So the council warned them ever more strongly and then set them free. They saw that it was impossible to punish them because the people were all praising God for what had happened. The man on whom this miracle of healing had been performed was over 40 years old. Would these religious leaders have preferred that people were not being healed? Of course. It threatened their authority and their wealth. Yeah. It's interesting to observe that the Christians were not afraid to meet in the temple courtyard. They met at a place called Solomon's Porch. As they fellowshiped together and listened to various ones speak, many were added to their group. So, at this point in time, what do you think is happening? <laughs> the Christians, even though they had, Jesus had been crucified, and they had been told not to speak in the name of Jesus, they were doing exactly what Jesus did. They would come to the temple early in the morning, they would, a small group would gather and they would start speaking about Christ and before you know there would be this huge crowd and who could do anything against them when this whole crowd was, was there listening to them. They couldn't be arrested, they couldn't be dealt with and they did this regularly. Not, not too long ago there was a uh, story where a bunch of educated people went uh, in the mountains someplace and they got into this tent with hot rocks oh yeah and three of them died but they believe in something but it wasn't in god's power it wasn't that man yeah. yeah well it's important for us to recognize or is it important for us to recognize satan's power absolutely yes. do we need to study how he tempts people absolutely well what are satan's most successful temptations Some might say, say, some might say, wine, women, and song. Yes. <laughs> or power, wealth, and fame. Mm -hmm. Pride, money. Yeah. But you're pride, going, yes. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a better person following me than following God. Mm. While we may need to have some knowledge of Satan's activities, it is far more important for us to recognize how Christ overcame him, and we can do the same. Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now, the verses just before this, and maybe we have a moment, we'll, we'll read them. Look at this. What human nature does is quite plain. I'm starting from Galatians 5, verse 19. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself in immoral, filthy, and indecent actions, in worship of idols and witchcraft. People become enemies and they fight. They become jealous, angry, and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. They are envious, get drunk, have orgies, and do other things like these. I warn you now, as I have done before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. But the Spirit produces, and this is the verses hopefully we're all much more familiar with, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these. How, well, these, did, how did Jesus overcome Satan? I am sure that what happened in that case, and in every case through his life, was he was so close to his father, and he understood him so well that even the slightest hint of an attack from the devil, Jesus knew about it and he, was, he met it just like that. Yeah. Well, these verses tell us that the of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which it is possible to have in our lives. Many Christians believe that they must pray for the Holy Spirit to take control of their lives. But there are several problems with that approach. If you pray for the Holy Spirit to take control of your life and you continue to sin, are you going to blame the Holy Spirit for your sins? And how can you know for sure it is not Satan 
who is actually taking control of your life. Furthermore, it is very interesting to note that the last portion of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control. Self -control. God does not want to take us into heaven as robots, which he controls like puppets on strings. He can only admit to heaven people who have learned the truth well enough and understand God well enough so they choose to do what is right because it is right. Thus, when the Holy Spirit has finished his work, he can step aside and we will exercise our self-control in the right way. You can read all about that in Desire of Ages 668.3 that we read earlier in our program. By the way, if you would like to use any of these materials that we've pulled together in this handout, they're all available on our website, theox.org. Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. In 1 Peter 3, verse 5, I'm sorry, in 1 Peter 3, 2, 5, the three chapters, Peter spoke a great deal about suffering. We are reminded once again that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And there's especially 1 Peter 4, 12 to 19, and 5, 6 to 11. Paul added that all who live godly lives will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3, 12. We live at a time and a place in history when persecution is almost unheard of. Is that because we're not living godly lives? Well, look what happened to Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, starting from verse 16 to 29, and just get a hint at what happened to Paul when he, left, he began living a godly life. And then compare 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 17. Paul assured us that these temporary afflictions, however bad they may seem to us at the time, quote, will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory. This is the truth to which Christians can always look forward. We need to live as if we really believe it. So Peter and Paul both said, you know, life may not always be just peaches and cream or roses here on this earth. There's going to be your share of thorns. There's going to be your share of problems. In fact, the closer you live to God, the more you're like him, the more likely the devil is going to want to attack you and try to do everything he possibly can to thwart you. But by prayer, with the help of the Holy Spirit, through the suffering and, and, and death of Jesus Christ, and through the help of the Father, we can conquer the devil, and you can too. See you next week.